My Hand of Glory by Michael Sisko. The best Christmas gift I ever received was My Hand of Glory. I found it mixed in with the other presents, unlabeled, unwrapped, unadorned, taped up loose, sliding back and forth in a battered cardboard box beneath the tree in the park. I opened it right there and then, on Christmas Day, and I knew immediately what it was. It still had all its nails, and was distinctly corded across the back with tendons, bone dry and discolored, as though it had been baked in an oven. I didn't dare touch it at first. I brought it home, still in its box, tucked beneath my overcoat. No one noticed me. Plenty of people walk around hiding things at Christmas. In my room, at my desk, I opened the box and stared at it again. The thumb was nearly as long as the other fingers. There were no scars. There was no ring, no candle or wax dripping. The bones of the wrist were splintered, jagged where the hand had been hacked away. There was a rustic elegance about it, and a power. There were times I worried it couldn't be entirely concealed in its box. Those long, clever fingers must have played something, piano or guitar, perhaps. I could imagine them nimbly stitching up a seam or folding origami. There was, at most, only the barest suggestion of the odor of decay. More decay. More noticeable by far was a spicy smell, like black pepper. A distinguished smell that made me think of snuffed candle wicks or freshly sharpened pencils. When my awe had subsided enough to allow me to touch it, I felt a cold current of old electricity go through me, like the charge from an antique battery, as if electricity could feel old. I turned the hand of glory over, carefully studying the palm. Even stretched like a drumhead, it was deeply engraved with long creases. When I looked more closely, I seemed to see the whirls of the skin's grain shaping astrological and occult symbols that vanished the moment I traced them, although I knew they had only disappeared from view, that they remained unseen. There were calluses at the base of middle and ring fingers, and perhaps that smudge at the base of the little finger was another. Lying on its back, fingers stiffly extended the open hand, far from forbidding me the way an upraised hand would welcomed and even accommodated me. It was my hand of glory, I could tell. I alone had been allowed to find it. How many others had passed by that tree and failed to see it before I came? And I found it right away. It was the first thing I saw beneath the tree. And what had there been to see but an old box? Who but me would have bothered to take it up and look inside? There was no doubt at all that the hand of glory had to be mine. Who gave it to me, though? Perhaps it gave itself to me. So it's not necessary to thank anyone else. The secrecy was another gift. Not a word to Mac about it. Not a word to Cousin Doris, not a word to anyone. That night, it had to have been that night, was the first of the new nights for me, when I first learned what sleep really is. I was sleeping the deepest sleep of my life. I'd be gone, completely gone, the moment my head hit the pillow, no matter how my thoughts had been racing just a moment before. I found myself hurrying, rushing to think about the things I had to think about before I got into bed, because I knew there would be no more thinking the moment I lay down, and, bear in mind, this is me I'm talking about, I used to lie awake for hours before sliding into an unsatisfying shallow doze that broke and resettled, broke again over and over all throughout the night, so that I never did get more than a quarter of an hour's actual rest at a time. A dozen times each night, I would twitch myself awake, stir, 
turn, groan, and hear my own voice return to me, weirdly changed from the wall. But in the new night, falling asleep was really like falling. Practically in the same moment I lay down on my bed, I would be released, falling asleep at once and falling all night long. So, even though my life was, in every way, the same empty farce, the same drudgery, the same loneliness it had always been, and Mac was Mac, Cousin Doris was still the same, I was waking up each morning refreshed and even lively, with a spring in my step, a certain lust for life. It had to be my hand of glory. Sometimes, when I woke up, I would find myself standing already at my desk, the box open in front of me, my fingers outstretched, brushing the dry tendons, the ridges of skin pleached up at the joints. If I turned from it to face my day, I did it unwillingly, it's true, but with a harder, more valiant core inside me all the same, the hand of glory picked me. I just couldn't forget it. Some people noticed a change, I'm sure, but what did it matter to them whether or not I changed at the end of the day? When it seemed as though I should feel defeated, I would open the box and brush the hand of glory with my fingers, and something like a dim foreshadowing of ecstasy would sometimes flicker up in me, as if my heart had turned to solid gold. It was first thing New Year's Day when I woke up feeling something in the bed with me. It was soft and chilled down by my left foot. I reached down to grab it, see what it was, but somehow I couldn't find it, couldn't feel anything down there but the weight of the sheet and the cover. Finally, I had to turn in my narrow bed to snatch it, thinking that maybe a mouse or something had died in there with me. But my left hand was what my right hand was holding when I brought it back up from beside my feet. My left hand had come off by itself during the night and floated down toward the foot of the bed, falling with me as I fell through sleep, but not attached to me anymore. It was cold and limp. And the thought of it, my numb own fingers brushing my foot as I slept, sent a crushing wave of nausea through me. I flung the thing away. I couldn't bring myself to look at the stump at the end of my arm. I knew it would be raw red tissue inflamed and weeping, with the bones protruding like glistening white molars. Bile gushed in my throat, and I slid off the bed and checked the linen for signs of blood, but there was only a little damp spot down by where my waist had been. Such a small spot, it didn't seem likely that the prodigious amount of blood I must have lost would have dried so quickly or left so little trace, and the fluid there didn't smell like blood at all. It might have been saliva, I guess. Perhaps the stump dripped saliva. I turned, and my eyes fell, of course, on the box. It sat in the corner of my desk. Even though I had put it away in its usual hiding place the night before, I didn't need to think about it. For once in my pitiful life, I knew exactly what I was doing. It was necessary to do it in one decisive movement, right now. Even a moment's delay would show a lack of faith, and I could lose it all. So I went directly to the box, opened it, pulled out my hand of glory, removing it from the box for the first time. And now I knew why I'd been so careful to keep it virgin, keep it in the box until now, so that its powers would not be in the least dispersed until it was ready. Because this was something that had to happen, and that had always had to happen, and I pressed the severed end of the ragged, leathery wrist to the numb and raw stump of my left arm, hearing my left hand flop on the floor behind me, in an impotent protest. My eyes were shut hard, streaming with tears. There was no pain, but I felt an explosion of fiery itching that made me bark and leap in place, strangling my sobs as best I could. The echoes of my voice in the silent room came back to me like the noises an animal might make in pain. Time was 
passing. I had to open my eyes. What was done was done. But irrevocable things aren't easy to look at, even when you've chosen them. When at last I did open my eyes, lower my head, and raise my arm, I felt a smile parting the curtain of tears that were already drying on my face. Never to fall again. No, never again. My hand of glory is clever. Already it perfectly mimicked my natural hand. It was still long, dry, cold, but the trenches between the bones had filled, and every moment its color was more and more the color of my right hand. Soon it was an even better, more plausible, and more vivid color than my right hand could manage. Once upon a time the left hand had been reserved for baser tasks, but for me, from now on, my right hand would handle the banalities of life. My hand of glory was ascendant now. Now things really would be different. I could have laughed right in Mac's face when I saw him. Really, it was only the power of the hand that gave me the strength to contain myself. Happy New Year! I nearly baited in his face like a mad dog, wild with hilarious vindication after ripping itself free from its chain. What was it like the first time I touched something with my hand of glory? I can't recall what it was I touched first, although I suppose I was very careful to choose something auspicious. The sensation took my breath away and left me gasping as if my chest were being squeezed in a vice. It wanted to be alone and swinging freely by my side, although I could just stand having it in my jacket or trouser pocket, if not for too long. It felt at once too much and too little. Texture, pressure, temperature, all in the abstract in comparison with the unremarkable and ordinary sensations transmitted to be by my quotidian right hand. If I were to place it on the desk in front of me, for example, I would feel a tactile version of an image of the grain of the wood, and the feeble warmth of the desk lamp that shone on it would register to my nerves as a sort of patina, finely granulated and measured out in an exact number, unknown to me, but not entirely. The fingers opened and closed as usual, the hand moved on the wrist, which still itched maddeningly where the flesh had knitted together so precisely there was no mark at all, no sign of any kind that any graft had taken place. But even then, the motion was also abstract. Each movement of each digit had a distinct character and numerical regularity, or should I say a geometrical aspect, I couldn't understand. I couldn't rationally fathom, but which I could feel as plainly as I might say, that's the color orange, or this chicken is salty. My hand of glory inscribed its geometrical designs for itself, or for someone to see, or not yet, directly into space, etched them there with every motion it made, even as it hung from the end of my arm and I passed from place to place. With greater understanding and keener vision through the darkness of everyday life, I perhaps will one day see those lines and read those angles and figures as readily as I do written words now. It still makes me smile when I remember how terribly, terribly careful I was with my hand of glory at first. It still makes me smile. I kept it in my pocket ineptly hidden away, as if it weren't uniquely gifted at fooling people, but then my caution was forgivable, and forgiven, since it arose from love and from a beginner's ignorance about what the hand could do, and no one ever looked at me anyway, that was one of my more typical problems. When I walked down the sidewalk, I had to weave this way and that, and even step out of the stream of foot traffic into doorways or behind mailboxes, because people would have walked right into me if I hadn't, would have thrown me down and trampled me, stepped right on my face with their filthy soles and impaling high heels. But that time, the big man coming toward me on New Year's Day, heedless, eyes on his ridiculous phone, without a thought I waved at him, waved at him with my hand of glory, and he turned aside. Or should I say, he was turned aside. 
turned aside for me, who had always been the one to turn aside, not the one anybody would turn aside for. I passed him by, exultation in my throat, and I had to step into the doorway of an empty storefront to collect myself, to press my hand of glory to my chest, and ask it to still my bursting heart. I used to think that glory came to you after you did something, but now I understand that it comes first. Glory picks you out and strengthens you to do what must be done. Now I understand the legend comes first. It is written. It is the beacon that pulls you out of the dark. The hand of glory unlocks all locks. It open, opens all doors and unravels all knots. It sheds a light that only I can see. It keeps the awoken awake and keeps the sleepers asleep. My first night, with the hand on my arm, I went to bed so uncertain and afraid that I was shaking. I lay on my back, afraid to turn on my side, thinking I was going to vomit if I did. A painful sweat burst from every, spore, from every pore. It was like I was creaking with that antique electricity again. I didn't fall asleep. I didn't drift off uneasily in the old way. Instead, my soul pulled free of my body. It slept, but I stayed awake. The moment my soul got clear, the pain stopped. It was exactly like sliding into a pool on a hot day, except that the medium I joined didn't have the weight of water. It was lighter than air, a light I couldn't see, not yet, but that I felt sure I would learn to see. I felt my hand of glory taken by another hand that held it and drew me along. I felt the burning itch there, there, where it joined my wrist, and I feared that something was trying to pull it off, and I would rather have died than let that happen. I wanted to double around my hand of glory, like a cat coiling around a mouse. But the tension in my arm was not fierce, not predatory at all. The fear left me. I was being led by the hand. I felt the fingers of my hand of glory close on that other hand, fibrous and inert, like paper mache. I couldn't see who was leading me, but I knew they weren't invisible. They weren't in the dark. They were lit up with light I couldn't see yet. They were going to lead me by my hand of glory to the light that it cast, and I would see them by that light then. I just wasn't different enough yet. But I had to try. That was part of it. Now that I think back on that night, <clears throat> I think I did see something. A flash of an outline, a stiff form maybe, just dimly illuminated against the unseeing. I can't call it darkness because it's full of light. It's the sleeping world that wants me to believe in it that puts the darkness between us. I have to keep pushing farther into it to get through, to see the glory of awakening. In time, I will see the one leading me by my hand of glory. In the stories, the hand of glory is caricatured as a tool for thieves. What would burglars know about glory, the hidden light? Who could care about anything else if they truly possessed glory already? If I'm going to be a thief, then I will be a thief who steals back what is mine, all those stolen moments wasted trudging through one weary day after another, running errands for Mac, Mac and Cousin Doris, Mac and Cousin Doris. Thin pretexts. I can hear laughter somewhere. I think it must be mine, too. They are going to throw me out of here. It won't be long before I hear their feet on the stairs. Let's go and see what he's been up to. I can't remember when I last went up there. All a dream, another bunch of blandishments conjured up by sleep to darken my path and keep me from glory. But I belong to glory now, or I know now that I always have, have always belonged to glory, always. I come and go, but the tinsel of life, the baubles and carols, are to be swept away. Now my task is to remember and meditate on what the hand shows me when my soul breaks free in the night and nothing else. I'm done serving. I know they are coming for me. And my hand of glory is ready. 
The door to my room opens after a decorous knock. I never lock it anymore. What do I need a lock for? Two of them, decked out in their badges and their city regalia, how cheaply bought. I show them what real glory looks like. I don't say a word, I just face them. I raise my hand of glory and I light it. That stopped them. Since that night, my hand of glory has no further need for disguise, but manifests itself for all to see in its true character. The sight is too much for them. They can't stand even the least reminder of their own blindness, although they would never admit it to themselves, let alone me, least of all me. Me, the one who knows them better than they know themselves, so they compel me to keep it out of sight, wrapped in bandages, as if I were disfigured. They would see it that way. They speak to me deferentially, or with a false amiability tinged with fear, as is only right. They know what I said to them that night. Their agents, no doubt, were well paid to relay it to them, word for word, as I knew they would. I spoke calmly, in a controlled voice, but the power of the hand was so great that my voice returned to me from the walls of my little room with such power they sounded like screams. I got a long look at them in the light that only I can see, hidden, not in a darkness that could only make it more conspicuous, but concealed in plain view within the gold and orange of the fire. That's what the candle was always for, by the way, to hide the real light, to throw the shadows that confuse the sleepers and keep them sleeping while I watch them sleep, hovering over them. I study sleep and sleepers. I can see their souls bundled up in sleep. A dormitory, a spider's larder, victims drugged, bound, waiting. My hand aches in these wrappings. They're always too tight. They want to keep me bound up tight like these others. Perhaps they hoped that one of them might take the hand from me. My hand, though, do they understand that my hand was never cut off from anyone but me? This is my hand. I took my birthright back when I pressed it to my wrist. How else can they account for the easy way I got rid of the false one? That's a point that's never even been raised. No one ever found it, did they? This hand chose me, came to me, was always mine, and so it can never be taken away, even if they cut it off. Is it any less mine, if it's cut off? The bandages may defend their eyes from the glory of my hand, but they can do nothing to balk its power. I still turn people from my path when I raise it. No door is locked to me. But what do I care about doors? No person is ever really closed to me, either. The light that only I can see cannot fail to reveal who is awake and who is asleep. And I am always shocked anew when I realize just how many sleepers there are, and how many of those who pretend to the great wisdom are not only themselves sleepers, but among the most deeply asleep. Sleep, all who sleep. Awake, all who wake. My hand of glory will never let you learn the truth. It shines only for me. Perhaps that was a mistake I made, too generous. That light is beautiful, the most beautiful thing of all. I haven't really seen it yet myself, but it's so beautiful I already know it in my heart. There. At the end of the hall, around the corner, past the last office, the emergency door, ajar as I must have wished, the hand cannot fail. The chill and blaze of the new year, of January afternoon, falls on me like night. The daylight hides me. You know you don't belong there. You don't belong around people. That's always been true, hasn't it? We must cleave to those things that have always been true. My hand is pointing, through the bandages, to the horizon. West, I think. Even distance is no barrier to it anymore. I can reach out. Just let me unwrap it. Reach out over the horizon and take hold of space. Seize it in the grip of my long, new fingers and pull the distance toward me. Pull it right up over the horizon like a heavy comforter. A distance that will stay distant from me even when I'm there, 
out where I will preside over a solitude so empty even I'm not there, forever alone in the awakened darkness of secret light with my hand of glory.